did my first book on the lember i finished up on 20 minutes uh, 60 minutes and uh, you know it was on the front page of the new york times and the wall street journal all over the place fantastic incredible publicity why why is it i thought that black jews are so deeply troubling to somehow to western sensibilities it was a it really puzzled me for a long time and it was interesting it was fascinating to see that enlightenment scholars at the end of the 18th century were equally puzzled and the reason that they were puzzled why were they puzzled they were puzzled because they didn't know how they became black and they thought that um, maybe it was a question of climate um, and there were lots of people who would come out and say yeah if you take an Englishman and you plant him in Central Africa leave him there for 10 15 20 years he'll turn black so this is the, this would be the explanation and so this was a proof if you like this was a great proof that climate is the thing that determines race and this fed into a much wider debate which bonnie i think can introduce of the difference in the book you use the phrase monogenism and polygenism is this the question you're looking for dr parfit yes i think that's exactly right please explain what they mean and how they shed light on today's issues of race relations well in the same way that um over the last six months, uh, you know, despite uh, everything else that, that is going on in the world, uh, we have been riven with uh, an international uh, debate uh, about race, uh, which one might think to be unprecedented, but it's not. Because from the last couple of uh, decades, probably of the of the of the 18th century right through until the Second World War there was an ongoing debate which was absolutely at the heart of intellectual interest throughout Europe and the United States and uh, other Western countries uh, about the origins of mankind and so the, the two main arguments uh, went like this pretty much, that either the Judeo-Christian Muslim idea um, of Adam and Eve uh, uh, was true, in which case we're all one human family, or, uh, and this is called monogenism, monogenism means that you know there was one father and one mother of mankind and we are ultimately all the same, or uh, that there were different founder events in different parts of the world and the different races were the product of quite different ancient ancestors and that the races concerned could not possibly under any circumstances change races were immutable both in terms of their physical biological properties but also in terms of their spiritual or intellectual capacities. The racial age, according to me, and I've, you know, the, the, the book I've been thinking about writing is not quite the book that I'm writing at the moment. The next book, or the, the book after that, will be looking at the, the racial age from a, a certain point of view and I could talk about that if you'd like me to know um, uh, but do stop me if you think it's going off on a tangent. Um, the racial aid really starts at the end of the 17th century with the work of a particular French uh, medical man called Francois Bernier and he was the first person to suggest that the world was divided into races. Nobody thought in those terms before Francois Bernier at all. And it seems very, very odd. There's a, always a great discussion, let's say, among American historians about, you know, what comes first in America? Is it race or is it 
uh, slavery. And the truth is that when slavery stopped, nobody was thinking in terms of race. So it could be that, um, that slavery in a way uh, developed into racial prejudice. Or it could be that sort of pre-racial uh, pre -racial prejudice, which is a kind of generalized prejudice on the basis of the metaphor of black had some uh, impact upon uh, people and their treatment of African uh, slaves uh, when they got to the, to the Americas. But it's a big kind of intellectual uh, discussion. And so the racial age anyway starts around the end of the uh, 17th century. It was, de de it was developed through the 18th century. All of the kind of uh, different gradations of race and the pyramids of race were developed in the second half of the 18th century. And then really became standard thinking by the middle of the 19th century. And the people doing all of this kind of racial structuring, uh, they were all polygenists because they all felt that race was the most incredibly important thing in the world. It was more important than religion. It was more important than history. It was more important than politics. It really was all of those things. And it wasn't that these people were particularly, you know, bad or nasty people. It was what they... What, some of them were, by the way, um, but it was really what they believed. And on the other hand, you had the monogenists who believed, no, um, everybody's, the, everybody's essentially the same. Some are, are more developed for historical economic reasons, and so on. but underneath the skin, we're all, we're all the same people. We all go back to Adam and Eve. And so why then, all of a sudden, um, do the people that we're all interested in this group, everybody here is interested in the question of Jews, as we say, uh, of color um, throughout the world. I mean, that's one of the, these are the groups, uh, Kalanu and me, uh, you know, we've been very interested in. And they've been marginal, they're still very, very marginal. They're very, very marginal. Uh, in terms of, let's say, Jewish historians, in terms of the state of Israel, in terms of what people are thinking about in the kind of general, uh, you know, Jewish journals in the United States and newspapers, occasionally an article here, an article there, it's marginal stuff. However, at the end of the 18th century and for the first half of the 19th century, Jews of color were not marginal. They were mainstream preoccupations of people. Uh, that's something which... I'm the first person to point out. It was interesting for racial theories for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that you've got, for the first time, the idea that Jews are multicolored. Right? And so that in itself is kind of interesting. But the underlying thing is the proof that this provides to the monogenists. And they took up the cause of all of these black, brown, Jewish communities throughout the world, like, you know, like it was um, the most fabulous, fabulous thing that they could imagine in support of their own ideas. And they would spend their times traveling the world and looking for new black Jewish communities, and they could bring these back and feed them into the, into the, into the racial uh, uh, kind of machine. And it was simply this, that if Jews can change racial look, if they can change face, if they can change color, as they did in the case of, apparently in the case of the Jews of Loango, or as they did in the case of the black Jews of uh, Cochin in Kerala, or as they apparently did in the case of the B'nai Israel of uh, Bombay in Western India, or uh, as it apparently did in the case of Jews who were living at the time in the Sahara, or as it appeared to be uh, with Jewish communities who, according to travelers, were at the time living in the, uh, in the Jordan Valley, about whom I sadly know not nearly as much as I would like to know, and various other groups, all of these kind of black Jewish groups, they were all kind of, dragoon as part of the holy crusade of proving the unified origins of mankind. What a noble thing 
that turned out to be. And of course, with Darwin, uh, that pretty much marks the end of, uh, of polygenism. Except that even today, there are you know there are genetic scientists who fiddle around with the with the proof in such a way that it looks as if you know there are races and that they're kind of significantly different from each other, but it really is not the case. And um, the Nazis, of course, were deeply, deeply, deeply uh, wedded to the uh, polygynist um, paradigm and particularly the idea that races could not change. So the Jews, they constructed as being a, you know, sort of mishmash, uh, almost an unrace, but deeply uh, dangerous to the, to the racial purity of the, of the Reich, um, but unchanging. They'd been unchanged and unchanging for thousands uh, of years, as indeed had the Aryans and, and other racial groupings. So should we go to the question about conflation? What does conflation mean? Were there different kinds of conflation of Jews and Blacks over time? Or should we go to the question of looking at your slides? Well, let me quickly just deal because the conflation is in the title of my book. And I think just to say what I mean by it would be a good introduction really to the slides. And Bonnie sort of mentioned um, very kindly a chapter in um, uh, that uh, 19, uh, 2013 book. Uh, and it, there was nothing original about that. Um, there's a great uh, scholar by the name of Sander Gilman um, who really is the father of uh, all studies about the perce uh, perceptions of the body of the of the Jew? He's an extraordinary scholar, and I, you know, I owe a huge amount to to everything that he's written, and I admire him enormously. And so, a long time ago, you know, he he wrote that um, you know there was a kind of medieval perception uh, that. Jews were black, and there's plenty of proof that uh, within Europe uh, the Jews were considered to be kind of black. There are many images um, of Jews be being black, and um, even if they weren't black, they were not even slightly black, they were kind of considered to be black in one way or another. So blackness and Jews really went hand in hand. If you read his work or if you read my work, and particularly if you read this new book, you will see the multitude of examples of it. And if you go, for instance, into the, into the marginalia, uh, you know, the illustrations in uh, English or uh, European prayer books in the 13th and 14th centuries, you frequently, frequently, frequently see hook-nosed Jews wearing Jewish hats and um, with black faces. So the idea that Jews were black is, was definitely there, uh, you know, before the, uh, before the Enlightenment period. And So we should, let's go to the slides now. Let, just to say, because I just need to okay. say, too, in the 19th century, the idea of uh, Jewish blackness was reinforced by the discovery of all of these actual black Jews in India and Africa all over the place. And by 1850, the, the main racial theorists of the day started saying that yes, actually Jews are Negroes. Negroes in some way are also Jews. This is the conflation. It's partly political, it's partly uh, metaphorical, and it's very, very uh, significantly uh, biological.